It's hard for me to introduce this woman without being so effusive that I start drooling on my bow tie. So I'm just going to list some of the songs she's written. Be My Baby, Baby I Love You, Do Do Run Run, Do Wah Diddy, Hanky Panky, Chapel of Love, I Can Hear Music, River Deep Mountain High, and Leader of the Pack. I was fortunate enough to sing some of those songs in a tribute to her called Leader of the Pack, which is soon coming to Broadway. Miss Ellie Greenwich. Carla, welcome to my den of iniquity here. Thank you for letting us into your home, Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure. Nice to see you, Carla. Great. We miss you with the show. Oh, you were terrific. Thank you really. so much. I really loved it. Uh, I want to know, or we all want to know, about the Brill Building and what that was like working there writing songs in the 60s. The Brill Building in the 60s. Well, you know, a lot of people ask me that question. And I think the best way I can tell you or any, anybody about the Brill Building in the 60s, it was a, a very innocent, fun time. Um, the Brill the business was relatively new. The Brill Building was the hub of activity. Lots of publishers, writers, musicians, everything was going on. Then it was a very alive place. People running in and out all the time, music going on day and night. And as far as the time, the 60s, it was a very young, new business, and there were a lot of young, new people in the business that just came in strictly to write songs and hopefully make a couple of dollars doing it. But our main thing was just to do our music, which we love so much. And I think there was a feeling of, of camaraderie and a feeling of just having fun with the music, just doing what you loved and just laying back with it and seeing what happened. And that feeling really came through with, with, with everybody. You said that people as much fun as you were all having, but you took your jobs really seriously. Well, we took it, it was a job. See, people say, well, I do music and that, you know, it is a job. If you want to make a living at it, it is your job. And you get up in the morning and you go to your office. I mean, I was working and married to Jeff Barry at the time. And we went to work every day and we got our paycheck, of course, advanced against future earnings, but we got our paycheck every week. And that was our job. That's what we did. And you wanted to do good at the job, and the better you did, the better you, the more money you'd make, a lot you know, of or whatever. So this is really, really what you did. I mean, this one's a school teacher, this one's a nurse, and I was a songwriter. You wrote with Jeff Berry, and uh, who were the other people that you worked with? Well, I worked mainly with Jeff. I mean, I came into the business about six months before I got married to Jeff Barry, so I had a little exposure to other people such as Doc Palmas who wrote Sweets for My Sweet and a lot of big hits back then. I worked with Van McCoy and a guy named Tony Powers and shortly thereafter I got really you know, involved with Jeff and married to him so it just made sense that we would do a lot of writing together. So you know, Jeff and Phil Spector were the main people that I worked with during the early 60s. What was it like working with Phil Spector? <laughs> oh dear, what was it like working with Phil? You've, I'm sure any story you've heard is true. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Phil was a wonderfully talented person. He strove for perfection, he strove for power and bigness. His favorite um, composer was Wagner, who was, you know, real power. I mean, I, we used to go to Phil's uh, office and he'd be sitting there actually conducting one of the Wagner pieces. He loved the bigness of the sound. Phil had a vision of a certain sound, his wall of sound that he wanted to, to create. And at all costs, this is what he did. I think he was extremely talented. And a lot of people had problems with Phil. But Jeff and I seemed to get his vulnerability a bit. And we got along quite well with Phil, considering how difficult he was to get along with. He was a very talented guy. He really was. What was the sound of the time? How would you describe music at that time period? You see, today, everything is categorized. Everything is ACDC, you know, new wave, old wave, you know, whatever. There was no category then. You just did what you did. And jobs were very defined back then. There was the songwriter, there was the artist, there was the producer, there was the publisher, there was the recording studio. You know, every job was pretty much defined. And we didn't have categories for anything. We just wrote our songs, hoped to find an artist to be a vehicle for the song that we wrote. You know, so it, it was a very, um, we just did what we did. There was, we didn't feel we have to write something, you know, nowadays with the dance music, you know, 128 beats per minute or else it won't get played in Chicago from 8, you know, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. You just did what you did. And I think that is why that kind of music, I think, seems to be very universal. It just came from our hearts. And if now if they want to categorize it and call it bubble gum and, you know, real heavy pop rock, you know, fine but we, we didn't we just wrote what we felt 
and now it's going into categories. We didn't do that then. You also sang on a lot of the songs. Probably, it, did you sing on all the records that you? Mostly all you the wrote? records. Yes, yes, that was great. As a matter of and fact, and you were a group, right? I the mean, raindrops. The raindrops. <laughs> yeah, a dummy group. That's what we call them, dummy groups. You know, we overdubbed all the parts. I was the lead singer and did a lot of the background voices. I think part of the fun then too was you were. You were exposed to a lot of different things back then, and you could be a songwriter, you could produce some records, and you could sing backgrounds on other people's records, and you could do the demos for the different publishers and stuff. So you got a taste of a bunch of different things. And you didn't get hung up saying, well, gee, I'm a recording artist, therefore I don't want to do a demo for this publisher or sing background on this one's record. It was really a lot of fun, and it wasn't even the in thing to do then as it is today. And you got a lot of exposure then, and it was a lot of fun to do a lot of different things. Okay. What was it like for a woman at that time period uh, in music to succeed as a songwriter or just as a woman in music dealing with all these men? Well, yeah, <laughs> well I, think it's, I think even today it's still, well, you know, Carla. <laughs> well, Grow up, you. Carla, you know. <laughs> no, basically, but I'm just the interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> no, basically, it, I, I did very well back then. I think maybe I had the protection of Jeff, too, being married to him. I had my male security blanket on one side. But when I first came into the business, I remember going up to publishers, and most females then were lyricists. And I used to go into these publishers' offices, and there would be all these girls all lined up with little cardigan sweaters on with the buttons open to about here, <laughs> you know, waiting to be, you know, to be tied up with some composer who could help them with their lyrics. And here I was, you know, with my little black skirt and my Peter Pan collar and my sorority blazer, you know, with the, my Mickey Mouse lashes and the blonde hair and the whole lot. And the publisher would walk out and go, and he'd point to me and say, come on in. And I actually played piano and sang, which wasn't overly popular then. You know, and so I think I was more accepted as Carol King was and whatever, because I did do the music and also were, back then the majority of females were really just lyricists. Oh, yeah. And then being married to Jeff, like I said, I think people were a little careful with me because I had a husband, a male there. The writing end was more open to females than the producing end. I had some problems in the studio when I was producing some records. Like, we don't like taking orders from a lady. Oh, no. I would the get that a lot. Oh, that? yeah. The artists, the musicians. I'd say, could you give me a little more of this, you know, on the bass and give me a chicka 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 on the guitar? And they'd go, you know, Ellie, we like you, but we just can't adjust to taking orders from a woman. Oh. So what happened was in defense sometimes, it's funny what we do, but I became one of the guys. I stopped wearing skirts, I would dress in my slacks and my little sweaters, and I'd walk and say, I got the best joke in the world for you. I became one of the guys. So the sexual thing was sort of eliminated. And after that, they said, hey, she could do what she does. It's terrific. It didn't become such a thing, but there's still... Even today, was that, even that. today, there's that little bit of an edge, yeah. I don't know why, I guess that's life, that's the world. We can change it, Ellie. I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, what was the point in time that you felt like you had finally made it? Well, I could um, send my parents to Puerto Rico. I was able to take cabs wherever I wanted to go. And I actually could go to Saks Fifth Avenue Active Sportswear Shop and buy two sweat outfits at the same time. And I knew I was there. <laughs> I just knew. Great. Oh. Off the top of your head, could you list who you think are your favorite New York music people, rock and rollers, whatever? Artists? Yes, artists. That's the appropriate word. Artists? Artistes? My favorite one, Carla DeVita, but you're not from New York. Well, I was here for a long time. <laughs> well, um, I think I've, of today, I think Cindy Lauper, one of my favorites. Um, of course, yourself. You've written with Cindy Lauper. I've written with Cindy. Um, Patty Smythe, Scandal. Well, I'm very You've big with girl singers, yeah. as you notice. Know, my girl singers and the girl groups, you know, comes from the heart. They love you. Um, there are. Uh, I happen to like Lou Reed a lot. I think you're going to be seeing him later, or you saw him already. Um, I don't know exactly who was from New York, so I don't know who I'm going to say is from New York. But I think my favorite at the moment really is uh, Cindy Lauper. Yeah. Really. Great. Okay. A funny story about Cindy Lauper, by the way. When okay. I was working with her, she goes, is this, song, is this song new wave enough? Is it really new wave enough? 
And I said, Cindy, I, you know, I really think it's, 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 it's a new wave. She goes, and she, I said, I mean, as opposed to old wave? And she goes, well, I want it to really be today and whatever. I said, well, listen, if you have old wave and you have new wave and you combine them, then you have permanent wave and it doesn't really matter which error you do what. And she goes, makes sense to me, makes sense to me, you know, and Cindy. But I really believe that. I think the music today especially, I think, really combines every element that's ever been out there. Well, melodies are coming back or something. Yay, the song is coming yeah. back. And uh, I hope that romanticism in writing, as in all your songs, comes back, too. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it is. it's funny, you know, Carl, it's funny when people ask me, like, you know, what were those songs? Where did those songs come from? They were just thoughts that we had. We weren't exposed to that much when we were that age. You know, we just knew from, oh, boy meets girl, lovey-dovey, uh-oh, he's cheating, uh-oh, I think I'm going to make it, though, it's okay. A lot of hopeful romanticism went on, and a tremendous amount of innocence, and I think people say, why do those songs, you know, work today, just as the Motown stuff does and everything. I think people really want to latch on to those kind of feelings. They want the romance. As, as big as they'll be in the sexual revolution, they're really out there. I really think they want to have that warm feeling for one person. They want, they want to really talk about being dejected love-wise and yet I'm still going to make it, you know, those kind of things. And I think the songs are very universal then. They really came from... You didn't think much about it, you just, it just poured out of you. And I think people can relate to that and make that become one of the memories. I really do. Well, you're, you're still doing that because in your show, uh, We're Gonna Make It After All is probably which you one, sang which so I great. To, <laughs> yeah. is one of the most beautiful ballads, and we did it as a duet. With you Rory and Rory Dodd. Dodd. Right, and uh, that's such a beautiful romantic Thanks. sentiment. And great melody. And, Still doing it in 84 Thanks. and on into the 90s, I'm yeah, sure. That song, too, I was really, it was five, a 5.30 a.m. song where I jolted out of bed and said, oh, I just, I just, something just came out of me, you know? So the, I, it was not thought about, like, gee, I think I'll write about, about. It just happened. Great. And Ellen. those things, I think, flow the best. They really do. Oh. I'm sorry, I don't, uh, what it takes, the process. Ellie, I'm a songwriter, but not certainly not in the caliber of you. What Don't you have a Diana Ross cover, Carla? <laughs> yes, Let's we're talking about Thank that. You, Diana. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for recording our song. What What does it take for you? You said you just wrote a song in the middle of the night. What does it take? It's really two parts to songwriting. I call it the organic part and all the other parts, okay? The organic part is writing the song just for the sake of writing the song itself. You just sit down and you write your song and you write, you write your melodies and you get your goosebumps and you get your little happiness and you write your words. And just for the sake of writing that song, you feel really good and that song is done. Now come all the other things. Now you worry about, well, because you're, you're in the business to make, you have to have a, you know, make your money and you want people to hear your song. So there's the artist and now the producer and there's the record label and there's the promotion and the song, your child, is no longer yours. It is out of your hands. I think the true thing for a songwriter is just the actual writing of that song. That's what songwriting is. After that it becomes a business. A business, right. You know? Yeah. And well you know, I mean you've done it and you know what that is. You know, I mean you told me too when you Diana Ross called you and listened to what your song sounds like, you went you didn't quite know how to react to that. It was like, wow, and oh, look what she did. She did a turn right, there. You did over that. the phone is a hard way to hear your song you know? for the first time, but it's also, wonderful. Also, there are some, I will give some pluses to that, too, because there are some artists and some producers who will take your song and make it into so much more than you ever thought that song could be, you know? So sometimes it is the most rewarding thing in the world. It really, really is. Well, but for us, it, we went crazy. I mean, we were so happy. We were jumping up and down that somebody, some person wanted to record you know, our really? music other than me. <laughs> well, to this day, is, I, my favorite thing is my true sign for me is like if I take out a box of tissues after I hear one of my songs that's been recorded, I know this song, I mean, they did a job and a half on this thing, and it's wonderful. Talking about songwriting, too, and, and the business, like, I think when I think about the different eras, because I'm a 60s person, you know, uh, that's where I come from. This, the 60s was really um, the music business. And of course, like everything, business grows and grows and expands. And it became, the 70s, what it became, you know, music business. You know, and songs were written really for the arrangements and for the production. And, and, you, and you made the song sort of fit that as opposed to making the arrangement and the production amplify and fit the song. Yes, 
I think the 80s is going back to some songs again, and I really think it's going to become a little more balanced. We won't, but the business, <laughs> and become the music business. There'll be a nice, even thing. There'll be room for the songs. There'll be room for enough good business things, and I really hope that happens because it'll make everybody feel good. Great. Really. And more romance. <laughs> yeah, really more romance. As a matter of fact, we had spoken about that. Um, I think that's one of the reasons the songs of the 60s really were very universal because people like romance and people like to have good feelings about the other person. And, and truthfully, the, the, as sexually revolutionized as we are, it's still boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they get along, they don't get along, they're married, they're breaking up, uh-oh, there's cheating going on, ah, but things are going to be okay. People all really can relate to that and need that. That's why I think the Motown stuff, the stuff that I was involved in, really, I think, just transcends any era. And people like that. People really want to grab on to a song like that and make that one of their memories. I really believe that. Great. Wonderful. That was really beautiful. Thank Yay. you. Yay. <laughs>